uh, holiday session. Um, I have a script here that I need to read before we officially start. So I'm going to do that now. Thank you so much for sharing that screen, Sarah. Um, and this is our um, Workforce Development Subcommittee. And um, as chair of the Workforce Development Subcommittee of the Law Enforcement Accountability Task Force, and in accordance with the passage of HCR 85, adopting rules of procedure for conducting virtual meetings of the General Assembly and its legislative committees during an emergency, this public body is authorized to meet virtually. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting in accordance with HCR 85. We are utilizing Zoom webinar for this virtual meeting. All members of this subcommittee have this ability to communicate contemporaneously on this platform. Should any subcommittee member experience technical difficulties, please call 302-519-4629. The public may listen and participate in this meeting by registering via the meeting link that is posted on the General Assembly's website. The public may also observe this meeting through a live stream available on YouTube. A link to the live stream can be located on the General Assembly's website. Public comment is permitted at the close of this meeting. Public attendees in this Zoom webinar must utilize the raise hand function to be permitted to speak and shall be called on in the order in which their hands were raised. Members of the public will be unmuted and given two minutes to speak. Public comments can be also submitted in advance and up to 24 hours after this meeting by emailing leotaskforce at delaware.gov. In the event that the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that any votes that may be taken during this meeting shall be done by a roll call vote. Let's begin today's meeting by taking a roll call attendance of the subcommittees present. Subcommittee members shall ensure that their cameras remain on for the entirety of the meeting to the best of their ability. When your name is called, please unmute your device and affirm your attendance. Once you've been recorded as present, please mute your device for the duration of the roll call. We'll begin the roll call at this time. I know that uh, Reverend Frank Burton, uh, as our vice chair, is unable to be with us today. Paige Chapman. I see you there, Paige. Can you unmute? Present. Thank you. Chief R. L. Hughes. Present. Thank you. Keith Hunt. I know he'll be joining us a little bit later. Representative Ruth Briggs King. Present. Thank you. Jane Hovington. Present. Chief Tory Jane. Present. Thank you. Corey Wright. Major Sean Marty. Present. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Moore. Present. Thank you. Ann Farley. Ann Farley. Abdullah Muhammad Bay. Sandra Smithers. Sandra Smithers. Bobby Wilson. Bobby Wilson. Kaylin Richards. Present. Kaylin Rich. Oh, thank you, Kaylin. And Alexandra Ramirez, I think we got a note from Alexandra as well and not to expect her at the meeting today. Is that correct? Thank you, everybody. That concludes the roll call. Was someone about to say something? Okay, there we go. There's everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, welcome back again after the holiday break. Um, we were not necessarily on break because we all had homework, did we not? And I just want us to start the agenda. So could we um, show for the screen, please, the agenda and then also the slide deck? Thank you very much. You know, I always, oh, let's go back. All right, you guys already know by now, I'd like to give us a little thing as to where we, we are and what have you. I'm Sharice Brewington, car chair of this committee, and it's my pleasure to continue to serve 
And I'd like to think that where we are in this process is we're making progress. So I just wanted to share these two quotes with you just for some consideration and thought. Progress always involves risk. You can't steal first base and keep your foot on first. So we're moving along as it relates to that. We're not on first base. We're not on third and we're not on home run yet, but we're moving along. Progress is not in enhancing what is, but in advancing towards what will be. And that's the direction we're going in. So thank you, everybody, and welcome to the meeting. Hope everyone's Thanksgiving holidays were great and that you're in process of getting ready for these season's holidays coming up. Next slide. So our agenda is as presented. Uh, we'll, we'll give introductions. We just really did roll call and introductions. We're all old friends here on the committee today. Everyone knows everyone. I think we don't have anyone that this is their first meeting session. And then we uh, will do our task uh, updates, our task assignment updates, task force updates, actually, that would be um, Representative Cook and also our co-chair, Daryl Parsons, just to kind of bring us up to speed, uh, giving us a worldview, if you will, as to where we are. Uh, we'll do our task reviews and some report outs on some of the information that you guys have suggested. And these are the core areas of task, our professional development, which includes um, recruitment and workforce retention, police incidents of physical engagement and violence, funding and capacity, if we have any data on that, general operating procedures and policies, and code of conduct guidelines. And then we'll talk about our next step and begin to talk a little bit about report development and our workforce development listening session, which we'll talk a bit about that, uh, planning that hopefully for January. Um, and then we'll schedule our uh, schedule for our next meeting and move to adjournment. That's our agenda as of today. I'd like to take a motion to adopt the agenda. So I'll make a motion, ma'am. Thank you. And we have a second. 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 Thank you. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you so much. The agenda has been adopted and we'll now move ahead to our task force updates. And then we'll ask Representative Cook and Co-Chair uh, Daryl Parsons if they would give us an update as to where the task force is, task force is today um, and any feedback that they'd like to provide at this time. Yes, first I want to say thank you for everyone participating. Uh, I know we have a lot of work to do. And just like you said, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're not the hare in this race. We are the tortoise. We cross our T's and dot our I's and make sure we just take our time and what we're doing. It's not a race to the finish. I just want to thank everyone. And I want to thank your, my, my chairs, sub chairs and, and co-chairs here. And um, we're moving forward. We're getting ready to do it. Uh, see where we are at so we can have a big meeting with our uh, membership coming up and see in the middle of the road where we are and where we're moving to. You're doing great work. Appreciate, I appreciate everyone here. And I just want everybody to think of your families right now and be safe. Uh, you know, things are happening. Um, and uh, I, I just appreciate everything that you're doing and we're moving forward. Uh, uh, we are blessed that, you know, that, that things are moving and that a lot of participation is, is being held throughout this uh, this task force and it's very, very important when you talk about this, this workforce and, you know, uh, we'll be coming up with some meetings with our co-chairs and chairs, vice chairs of these subcommittees and, and seeing where everybody are, are at and, and that, that uh, we're not overlapping and staying in our lanes. So, you know, thank you for all that you're doing and I appreciate it. And uh, Representative Ruth Briggs King, I appreciate you for being here on every meeting like I am. Thank you so much. And everybody here, thank you so much for what you're doing for the state of Delaware and also for the citizens here in the state of Delaware, our constituents. So I'm gonna let my co-chair take over from here. Thank okay, you. I'll echo, you echo the thoughts of, you know, thanking all of you for your lending your time and talents. We are in the midst of probably one of our busiest weeks as all four of the subcommittees are gonna meet uh, over an eight day period. Uh, so uh, I wanna really extend our, th our thanks out to staff for providing the support to make this happen as we wanted to get uh, the next set of meetings in before the holiday break for many of us. Uh, 
they will be working with you. You know, there's an incredible amount of information that is out there and has been supplied, uh, you know, to your committee and to the others. They're in the process of synthesizing it into some drafts um, that'll make it easier, you know, not only for you to work, uh, but for everyone to digest and bring forth um, some recommendations uh, in the spring of 2021, ideally. So again, uh, thank you very much. And I will turn the meeting back over uh, to your chair. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate that. Any questions, I'll ask the committee members um, if the, um, the chairs don't mind. Any questions that you may have of our co-chairs at this particular time on the task force? Anyone, any other members of the committee? Okay, all right, very good. So we'll get started. Um, over the Thanksgiving holiday, and actually for the month of November, we decided not to meet physically, but to have that opportunity to uh, read and uh, take in a lot of information that's been provided uh, to us. The staff did a yeoman's job of pulling together a number of documents that we have around um, public knowledge, actually, and information related to our law enforcement personnel, functions, operations, things of that nature um, here in the state of Delaware. And so what we did um, to, to divide some of that aspect of, 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 of wonderful reading material up for everyone is we asked you early on if there were particular areas of interest that you had and uh, in, in areas that you could help me, help us, together collectively as a group digest the information that we've received. And so a number of you uh, agreed to do that. I think we're gonna be doing that on an ongoing basis and what have you. So in that regard, we said we would bring that information back as a first look here in the December meeting and then begin to kind of you know get a, your perception based on your eyes on what it was that you were able to see, contrive, questions that you may have things of that nature uh, and what you'd like to share with the group and we'll begin to continue that. I think as Daryl said and, and Representative Cook has talked about in the future is that we want very much to look towards uh, development of a report and some accounting of what we've seen and what kind of content that we believe um, is there uh, before the General Assembly. Begin to do that internally, I think probably as a group, as the chairs, co-chairs of the committee look at that first and then begin to put together, you know, perhaps maybe um, this is what it is and then ultimately look at uh, some recommendations perhaps maybe down the line. So that's what we're doing today is beginning to scratch the surface, so to speak. And we asked you guys to do that in November. By no means did we intend that you would be able to digest perhaps maybe all of the information, but we thought it would be a good opportunity for you to be able to look at some of it um, you know, highlight it. I highlight things to death, I think, but highlight and ask my own self questions about the questions that I have. Um, and then also getting some content and knowing if there's someplace else we need to look next. So in that regard, a number of you agreed uh, as it relates to professional development, recruitment and workforce retention. And I, I, you know, you know who you are, we can call out some of those names, but I just really want us to start a conversation if we could about uh, what it was that you found. And we had uh, Paige, we had James Torrey, Brian, um, and let's see who else we have. I think that was it pretty much on that roof. I know you had an interest in that area too. We placed you on some other um, uh, items, but, uh, or asked you to take a look at some other items uh, for us, but that group in and of itself or that entity or those individuals uh, in terms of looking at those prospective tasks. So let me start with, First and foremost, you all all got the information that we sent to you, correct? Everybody and anybody, Brian, Paige, Jane. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good, okay, good. I wanna hear from you all in terms of what your thoughts were about what you received. We know it's a lot of information. I think at one glance, I saw that there's a document that we had like over 44 of the police entities where we actually had content and information um, back from them. So what, what did you see? What did you think? And what kind of information was provided to you? What's your first look um, at this information? Brian, Paige, Chief Tory. I'll go first. 
Um, Go ahead. So I went through that whole um, 44 page document. It was a lot of information. Um, what I thought was interesting is that a great majority of the police departments are, um, have 20 personnel or less. And one of the biggest complaints as far as um, recruitment and retention is that these officers are leaving these smaller departments to go um, to the larger agencies. Um, mm. And so, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on a solution for that, um, but I mean, I think there are departments that have three people in their agency, five people in their agency, one, one and a half. Um, and they rely a lot on um, the state police, particularly in the lower two counties um, for assistance because they don't have enough um, personnel. So I think there's something to be said and to think about as far as um, supports or what to do for these smaller agencies. And I think that also mm -hmm. plays into um, with training because it's much harder to have trainings if you're a staff of 10 versus the state police, which is a staff of 723 officers. So it's easier to have more training, to have more sophisticated training, to have more mandatory training because you have the support um, to have officers still on duty um, so those were my biggest thoughts, um, but I mean, I can keep going. So you, you guys be jotting down some questions too. One of the first things that came to my mind, Paige, when you talked about that, and you talked about the smaller agencies versus the larger, of course, the largest entity that we have in the state, is the relief factor, I guess, perhaps maybe when you talk about training, is that do you, do you have um, the, the relief factor that you need to actually do training, I guess, perhaps maybe consider it traditional training or any of those kinds of things. Was that what you were thinking when you said not enough folks there necessarily around the training opportunity? Yeah, exactly. So whereas the state police can have like a mandatory training and rotate based on people's shifts, you don't really have that same luxury um, for the smaller agencies. And so I think that's a problem. Um, if we want all of our police departments to have the top training and be all of them be up to date on what's the latest and the greatest. It's pretty hard um, for those smaller agencies to really engage in that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's an issue potentially that, you know, we may see. What did you see, Brian? Is, Paige, did you have anything else to offer in terms of your first look, first thought? Uh, no, I can um, defer to someone else. Okay, Brian, you have, did you, were you thinking about something? Well, I think the same thing, and, and I think one of the things that um, that I noticed and was a concern, and, and I, I echo Paige's point, which was, um, and, and I think historically, even before seeing the, that documentation, I knew uh, how many officers had come to smaller agencies, and then, you know, sort of what what, what we've started to see, and I think RL and, and Chief Tory and a couple others uh, represent that, is we have folks that may have started a smaller agency, they move on to the state police gain some knowledge, um, gain some training, and then end up in a leadership role for a smaller department. Um, mm. But it's how do how do we make those smaller departments attractive? How do we find a way to support them in the recruitment process? Um, and I, I immediately think of another task force. I'm on the volunteer firefighter recruitment, where we're trying to figure out how do we uh, create a single source of recruiting for all the fire uh, fire departments in our state. Um, you know, is there something that we can do for our smaller agencies to create, you know, sort of a cooperative effort for recruiting to highlight? Because in reality, I mean, some of these smaller departments, um, you know, you have officers that are getting a lot of, a lot of, you know, on the job knowledge and experience rather quickly, because there's not a, a detective bureau that you're going to be able to call in a four person department. They're having to call the state police for support, but a lot of times those patrol officers are getting a lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, skills on the street. How, how can we sort of uh, find a way to let people know that that's out there? Because uh, that, that's, you know, my fear is that um, that institutional knowledge that they're getting is in and being pulled to larger departments, uh, that's leaving these smaller agencies with a, a sort of a gap there. Uh, and how do we create a, a better uh, professional development opportunity for all of them? Uh, whether it's electronic, whether it's, you know, I, I don't know, there's gotta be a way that we can support uh, educating everybody as Paige said, 
it's, it's easier for the large departments to be able to schedule it. But if you've only got, you know, five or six feet on the street, then all the time. Did we lose Brian? Nope. That, that's it. That's a, oh, there that's a sort of like, okay, there like an echo. Okay. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. It went out just a little bit. So anybody have any, any, any questions of Brian? Why don't we let everybody that, that, that took a look at this and then we'll just, you know, we'll talk around a, a little bit more about that. Uh, what about you, Jane? You know, it's a, it's a little different for me because I'm, I'm on the law enforcement end of things. Um, and being in what you consider a medium-sized agency, um, I see kind of both sides. I, I'm fortunate enough that um, I'm able to kind of cherry pick some of these younger guys from these smaller agencies, but I'm also small enough that I do lose them to some of the larger agencies. So I, I kind of am in between. Um, so, you know, I understand exactly what Paige is talking about. And, and the same thing with Brian. Um, recruitment is probably one of the biggest issues that we in law enforcement have right now. Um, it, it all comes down to pay. I hate to say it, you know, and, and I don't know if there's any way that we can fix that problem because of course, each individual town sets the, you know, the starting pay for uh, an officer. And sometimes it's a little more appealing for others, um, you know, getting that higher pay raise and depending on the CBAs that are out there. So, um, you know, it's, this is a tough one. This, this is a tough one to combat because, you know, again, you're dealing with each individual town. Um, and, and recruitment, you know, again, you can go out there and you can, you can recruit at every college and every other place, but unfortunately you have to get them to come in. And, uh, you know, in Delaware, we have pretty high standards and, um, people have to pass those standards. So, um, it, it's, it's tough recruiting as well. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking about some questions and what have you as we go along as well. Um, who else did we miss in there? I think that was the three of you and then we had James and I know Al, um, Alvarez is not on today. So let's talk about it a little bit. So I, I had a couple of questions um, as you were talking just in terms of the, the information that you, you've seen and what you've looked at. So if I heard correctly, you, we're all recruiting from the same pool. Is that, is that your assessment? Uh, you know, it, it is and it isn't. There are some people that are out there that they are 110%. I just want to be a state trooper. And, you know, they're never going to come to an agency like mine. I've also got kids that have grown up in my town that the only thing that they've ever interacted with has been the Smyrna Police Department. And all they want to do is be a Smyrna Police Officer. So, um, yes, it's from the same pool, but no, it's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, may what I jump about you? Go ahead. Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, I just want to, I'm going to jump in and just because Tori brings up some, uh, an excellent point there, especially um, when he brings up the point around pay. And it is a, an unfortunate piece there that the, the pay um, inequities across the state are pretty obvious. And I'm sure everyone saw that when they took a look at some of the collective bargaining agreements that are out there. How that gets addressed, I'm not exactly sure. That holds true except for one agency in the state, one law enforcement agency in the state, uh, DENREC, Parks and Recreation. Uh, those rangers do not leave that agency. I guess they get in and they, that's the kind of work that they want and, and they stay. And, and unfortunately their, their pay is, is pretty low. So we need to figure out how, how they're able to retain most of their folks. But on the recruitment issue for smaller agencies, one of our problems or a problem that I have, and I'm, I'm sure Tori's faced this as well, we do not recruit annually, meaning or all the time in that, we, well, we are recruiting all the time, but we don't hire every single cycle. And that can create some problems when you're trying to have a recruitment program, when you're trying to go out and constantly keep people coming in, but it might be two years before you actually take someone on, bring on a new person. And that, that's really tough. Um, I know that when, when I was with the state police, we are constantly, we were constantly recruiting then because you, you know you're going to have that attrition. You know you're going to be having in a class, well, mm -hmm. in the good years and then when the finances are right, you're going to have a good a class coming in. And when you don't have that, that knowledge that you're going to be able to hire somebody, for example, spring is going to be a season where uh, there's going to be some rec uh, academies. The state police probably will offer up something. Mm -hmm. Dover is going to offer something. And I believe Newcastle County. But the way my budget process is here in my municipality, I'm not positive I'm going to be able to get approval in time to recruit someone for that. 
I'm missing an opportunity when some of the other agencies may be uh, recruiting some of these candidates that are out there and, and bringing them in. So that that's an issue for us. But uh, and I want so to let me ask you a question. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. Well, I just wanted to no, point out Paige's assessment on the training and some of the difficulties there and some of the smaller agencies. Whenever someone goes to training, someone has to work that shift that's left open. And so that becomes a cost factor too, because now you're paying time and a half at an overtime rate to have someone do that. Most often, I guess I can't say always, but most often we're paying that rate. So that does become a bit of a burden. And to Brian's point about virtual, there is an opportunity, I believe, for some virtual training that we're going to have to either develop here in the state, um, either Delaware develops that uh, through this entire process, through the task force, or you know, with through COPS and or the Virginia, Virginia Center for Policing Innovation um, is some good stuff that we've been using, but I think therein lies a, a good answer. It's not maybe the best, because I think one-on-one -on -one is better. These meetings would be better if we were face-to-face, -face, right? but one-on-one, -on -one, but yeah. I think that is a good solution for us uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. So so a couple of things you said there that, that, that made me think when you were talking about whether it's virtual training, but I want to go back to your budgeting cycles. And your budgeting mm -hmm. cycles are, it seems like I'm just thinking about some of the uh, barriers or just challenges that it sounds like that we're, we're kind of talking through a bit in terms of what you see. Let mm -hmm. me just preface all of this first by saying, I want to ask you all when you are referencing any of the terminology, whereas in some of us may know what you're talking about when we're using our acronyms, we've got the public that's viewing as well. So if you'd be so kind to make sure that you, you know, uh, say what that is specifically if they come up versus using our vernacular that we tend to when we're, we all know what we're talking about, um, that would be helpful. But if you could talk a bit more as you begin to, and I think at one point, and Paige mentioned this, we looked at, I think right now, we had data currently on, we have data on all 48, but we looked at 44, I think gave a hard look, or we had real good content, if you will, on 44 of the police agencies. And they range from everything from, you know, volunteer in terms of, of the staffing, all the way up to the largest police entity we have in the state, which is the state police, as, as you said earlier, with 700 plus or more personnel. And everybody, it appears, I'm sure, has different cycles, jurisdictions, all of those kinds of things. So when you say, Chief Hughes, about the budgeting cycle, can you talk a little bit more about the budgeting cycle and why, you, why perhaps maybe for, for your entity, you're unable, uh, we all know funding is always an issue in and of itself, but how does it prohibit you from bringing persons on and your recruitment class cycles, if you will? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so so in Georgetown, which is, I had to learn this quickly when I arrived, the budget year starts May 1st. And so that that's different than what I was used to with the July um, one start date, and then the feds being in October. So even if we have uh, some monies that are gonna come from the state and or the feds, they're coming in at different times. Um, so, so that is a ch challenge. The another challenge is, is cash flow. Here at a municipal level, I'm finding that we, we don't have the cash on hand to fund a position uh, until there's an opening. So, so it's difficult for me to hire someone, send them to training for six months, and then come out and work three months on field training um, and still have that person that the spots they're gonna probably fill because now I'm in essence paying for two people. Uh, we, I don't have yeah. that kind of cash flow revenue, revenue coming in. Um, so, so that creates a real problem. So it's when the opening occurs is when we then start seeking uh, to bring someone on board and then uh, you're already nine months behind. That's if you're getting ready, you could hire them that day and start a class that day. You have a hiring process that normally takes any, about four months to get through the, the hiring process. So you're, mm -hmm. uh, you're 13 months out to, to get someone. And so now you've worked 13 months down an individual or two and then throw on top of that some of the training when you're trying to do it. So you're 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 always chasing your tail on on these things. Sounds it sounds sounds like it. So depending on the budget cycle, depending on if there's a hard vacancy or not, you're not you don't have the the resources to do what we call in state government a dual income if you if you want you know if you if you could, um, and you're just looking to 
fill a spot. And ultimately, I'm just thinking forecasting wise, 13 months down the road, if you're looking at a position, is that still a need for the agency at that point or what's happening in the community even in and of itself? I, I, I just wonder about that. Right. Um, can we shift? I just want to ask you, Tori, about, you know, just, just you take, take advantage of, of our, our police folks that are on here with us to talk a little bit about those cycles. How, what's your funding cycle, um, Chief Tori in Smyrna? So we're a calendar year. So my, my new budget is getting ready to start. And just like uh, Chief Hughes, I, I, you know, for me, I just had two officers retire. Um, I'm adding some additional in. And I literally have to wait until January 1st before I can replace these positions. Um, so, you know, that that puts a burden on us to to get through it. Our process started around June and I'm not going to put them in the academy until April. Um, and just like Carl said, you're talking another six months in the academy, another three months out. So I'm not looking to put anybody on the street by themselves until mid summer or no, right around this time next year. Um, I will okay. actually physically have those officers here and on the road and able to utilize them. So, you know, it is, it's a budget issue for all of us. Um, we all kind of try to play that, that budget game to get through things. And I'm only able to, to do at least once a year with hiring, um, again, just because of how my calendar year works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anyone else have questions? I, I, I've got a number of, is that, who was that on there? I had a uh, question. Briggs King. <laughs> Go right ahead, Ruth. Thank you. Just a couple of questions. And one of the things which, you know, um, might be a, a matter of coming back to the town agencies themselves and saying, um, do you uh, have a problem staffing? So you basically, when that person leaves until you can hire, recruit and train, are you incurring overtime or um, additional compensation to cover that loss? And that's an argument to take back to the town saying that, you know, because this is the exact same issue we had in corrections where, um, you know, we couldn't hire up quickly enough. And so we were either freezing in time, had excessive overtime um, cost while we had burnout at the same time. So is there a way to look at the cost share on that? But I think it goes much deeper. And if I can compare it a little bit to education, and in education, the state, as you know, funds every school district the same for teachers on a pay scale. And then the district may use local funds for some other specific purposes. But it almost sounds at some point, because when you have this constant attrition, recruitment, retention, and retraining, that we're spending tax, and it's all taxpayer money, we're spending that money unwisely because we're, we're just shifting it from one town to the other town to the other town and, and impacting public safety at the same time. So there ought to be a way to look at that a mechanism. And just because we haven't done it doesn't mean we can't. Maybe that's a recommendation we should have to say, is there a way to level the playing field so that if you're in poor little Dagsboro, Delaware, um, and you can only have a force of one or two when you rely heavily um, on, on others to help for stuff. How can we raise that up? Because it's not only a staffing issue, but it's also a training issue and equipment. It's, it's several other factors that come in there. So, you know, that's, that's mm -hmm. one of my concerns. And then the other concern is looking at um, how we're doing things and by having a really good cadet or some other type of program. And maybe instead of um, actually bringing them on that in exchange for that, there's a, a pilot program that would help pay for education. And that education includes some of what you might usually do with the academy, so that that's already being done so that the academy time could be reduced to other things more specific. Just thinking out of the box as both an educator and an HR person, are there, and I think that's one of the things where, are there some other ways besides how we've always done it um, that we can, that we might be able to look at? Just some comments. Yeah, yeah, this, this, these are all, you know, probabilities. I'm just trying to get to and helping us. And I know, I think Keith has joined us as well. Keith Hunt has joined us and I think he's got his hand up. I'm trying to look at the controls and look at two devices too. But I, just before we get to you, Keith, um, I, I wanna make sure that we get content um, before and get some ideas about what's out there great ideas and what have you before we get to to you know complete solutions and I, I just wanted to know or just in general um our task force chairs um to begin to think about things like uh, potentially 
do we know at any given time um, how many vacancies we have in law enforcement in the state of Delaware? And while we know we've got it, you know, divided by jurisdiction, but would we necessarily know that? So it makes me think like, you know, when we have ultimately an incident, like there's been a lot of reporting in the last few days about uh, some of the uh, class one and uh, critical incidents and what have you. And along with that, um, that's what we focus on, which we should focus on and, and what's happening in terms of management of that. But did we know necessarily like what's the vacancy rate? You know, what is the, um, the, the staffing related issue to Ruth's point when she talks about um, the shifting of, of resources, if you're going to pay overtime here, that's much because someone else has got to work to cover what you don't have. Um, is that the best place to spend it? Just thinking some things out loud um, in, in, in general. And I want to get to Keith and then I'll come back to you. Did you have something, Chief, as well? You want to hold on it for a minute and we'll get back to get Keith. I think he's um, joined us. And then did you have a question also, Keith? No, uh, I, I apologize. I, I did try to explain uh, my lateness, but uh, I was listening in on Chief Hughes' explanation of the um, the overlap and the need uh, around budgeting. Mm -hmm. And I know you summarized his comments, but I, I did have a question to him as far as having now lived that experience. And I know he came over from mm -hmm. uh, state, but having now lived that experience and given all that he's described, if he ruled the world, what would his solution be? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, and and I don't want to I don't want to interrupt the flow because I've been in and out because trying to log in correctly here. But that was the question that I had at the time that I raised my hand. What would his solution be? But but I'll I'll, I'll defer to you to carry on the. Well, well, let's 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 say this is that you know if, if we don't want to kick the can too far down the road with solutions, but while we have Chief Hughes here. And we have two stories as we begin to talk about these things. If you had your dream list, if you, you know, your crystal ball, what would that look like? What would it look like? I think is what Keith is asking is, is that, you know, what would be the resolve? Would it be um, having enough resource to, and I'm, I'm not giving you the options, but I'm just thinking out loud, having enough resource to, to hire or anticipate hires, or would it be, you know, you want to be able to have a, a different type of funding cycle or what would that look like in terms of fixing that issue or those challenges that you expressed to us earlier? Mm -hmm. Tori, did you want to go first? Both of you. Let's uh, Tori, let's hit Tori, and then we'll go Chief Hughes to see what what you all thinking. Tori. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? That's all right. Yeah, we can hear you now. So what uh, Representative uh, Briggs King had suggested actually was something that was done or what the inception was there, I guess, RL. Um, I think it was a partnership between the state police and Delaware Technical Community College. Um, and they had a program that was like that or was supposed to be like that where you could go through college classes and what it was supposed to do was supposed to reduce the amount of time that somebody would have to go through the academy. Um, don't really know what happened with it. Uh, I don't think it ever really came to full circle with it, but it was in place. You know, it's a great idea, um, at least on paper. Um, you know, we just kind of all try to make the best of what we can we can do with what we have. Um, and I don't know what the, the answer would be. I really, you know, for Keith's answer, I wish I knew. I wish I could say, you know, hey, we could do what Pennsylvania or Maryland does, but I don't think that that would work in Delaware because we've all seen some some individuals that we've hired from uh, from those states where it's just their training just hasn't been up to par for what we require here in Delaware, so it just didn't work for us. So I, there's a lot, um, and I, I don't know, maybe RL or um, somebody else has a suggestion, but it, I definitely I'm not sure what that answer would be. What are you thinking? What are you thinking, Ariel? Well, I've got the microphone, so I'm going to say it. I Go think it. There, there are some solutions out there, and I think that uh, the representative is on to something there. Uh, I know to Tori's point, there was some uh, talk about a partnership with Dell Tech at one time, and I think it was their LEO program, and, and that's still going on, but I'm not so sure how, how well that's, that's expanded or, or evolved over the, over the years. 
There are a number of models throughout the United States, throughout Canada, and throughout Europe that incorporate uh, academic institutions into police training. In fact, in Michigan, there's Fair State University that has a, it's a bachelor's degree. When you graduate from Fair State University, you have a bachelor's degree in police science. And in Michigan, under their post, under their Police Officer Standards Commission, they are ready then to go to become a police officer. Now, they still have to go through a field training program. Um, that's always going to be the case. Some of the pushback that, come, that comes from these kinds of programs, and I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, I pushed back on these years ago um, on these kinds of programs because we were, we felt, or I felt at that time that our academies where we, we needed the person to be in the academy so that we could then bring them into the law enforcement culture. And there I said it, the law enforcement culture. What we need to do is to bring in all the other cultures into law enforcement. And so that's a, I, that has my, my thinking on this has evolved. And I like to think it's because not that I'm older, but maybe just a little bit wiser. And so if I think that education is very important in our profession, and so I think we need to put more emphasis on having education. So in Delaware, you must be 21 years of age in order to be a police officer. In between 18, leaving high school until that time, there's time to go to school to further your education. Use that time wisely. Maybe we develop a program either with Delta 8, Dell State or Dell Tech or UD or Wilmington University, or there's multiple programs where you create a, a recruiting pool. Um, Chief Downs, Harry Downs at Dell State, he and I were just talking last night after the community engagement uh, uh, working group, talking about some things there. And he has some ideas around Dell State and how their partnership could be. And, uh, and TJ, the uh, chief at Dover, talking about a law enforcement institute uh, in Delaware. So there are ideas out there and they're being embraced by some of the chiefs on how we can better expand the, recru the recruiting pool uh, for folks. And, but we are gonna have to address the issue that the representative uh, Briggs King talked about on the pay. And I know having been served on a local school board and also on the state board of education, um, there is some of those supplements that come in from the state and, and we do that. Is that an option? I don't know, we're, we're talking a lot of money. And so I don't know if that is an option. Um, some people would say, well, wait a minute, why don't we just have one huge police department in the state of Delaware? That is an option. Um, but I would, I would say that some of your folks in your communities, the commu Georgetown community, I would hope they would say, they like their police department um, and they like having uh, the police here with them. And so there's a, a, some accountability to the community. But again, there are multiple solutions out there. I, I don't want... I don't want us to stop imagining of how things can be. We need to be talking about them. And I know to Tori's point, some of the folks that have come from other states that have come to Delaware haven't worked out, but there are others that have worked out and done very well. Um, there's a great mm -hmm. uh, academy that is run down at Warwick Community College down near Salisbury, the um, Eastern Shore Criminal Justice Academy. It is a model there at that school. It, it does a very nice, they put out a very nice product and I've seen it working, I, I would almost, we could almost do a field trip and have folks go down and take a look. The director is, would welcome us anytime. I think any of us at the, in this COVID environment would welcome a field trip anywhere <laughs> right now. <laughs> it would be great to go somewhere, wouldn't it? And I think all of you all, we could all go together. It would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Um, question, I mean, we could, we could talk about this a lot, but again, this purpose of this meeting was intentional to be our first look. And if you all are doing exactly what I dreamed and hoped that you would do is begin to think about where we are, what we're doing, what's going on, what's the situation from the data, from the information that we have, and again, begin to think about, well, why is that? What's going on and why do we have that and understanding it better? So it, it gets back to the original intent, which is, is that telling the Delaware story. Are people aware of the Delaware story and exactly what's happening? Many of you are because you're so close to it and you're working in it every day, but in general, would folks know that's the issue? Makes me think about uh, what happens when there's that, that report that comes along, representatives on here, that overtime report that comes out ever so often that talks about you know, how much overtime is being paid everywhere. I don't recall necessarily seeing as it relates to, I know corrections is there and kids department and different ones, but I don't recall seeing what it means for police. I don't recall that. And maybe I just overlooked it. But do we really know 
what that means in terms of those resources. And I know for me and Keith, I'm sure you, you can appreciate this as well in HR is that um, along with overtime, and I would call it sometimes in my law enforcement days, involuntary overtime, there's a lot of things that go along with that. Um, if you have to work a shift or work something and what have you, what's the impact on the officer? What's the impact on the family? What's the impact in general around not just getting the resource and the money? The fatigue, all of those things that ultimately might present themselves around having staff shortage or not having adequate uh, staffing, if, if you will. So these are some things I think that ultimately it would be good to take a look at or know what those issues are before we have to take a look and know what those issues are, as some other communities have had to do, and nationally has been part of the dialogue. So um, anything else in terms of that group there that's just burning on your mind? We're going to come back and talk to you some more, because I know you've got some more reading to do and content. Brian, anything else that was, you know, kind of like stirring on your mind in terms of what you saw that just kind of stood out for you? No, I think hearing that conversation, I think RL and the chief, uh, uh, have all reinforced sort of what we were looking at is how do we how do we create a, an equal playing field for them? I was sort of looking at it from the retention standpoint. Is there some sort of mm -hmm. a benefit that uh, we we would be able to find that we could provide and help the, the smaller agencies so that they're you know, maybe they can't cover it with pay? But is there something else that we could provide that would be able to encourage officers to stay? And and I, I liked our else thought was maybe the question we should be doing is. Uh, asking officers in the field, what would keep you at, a, at at the agency where you are now? What are we missing? And having other options other than just because uh, they're going to click the dollar sign first, but but see what else comes after the dollar sign that uh, we may be able to create, you know, with sort of the, the power of, uh, of a larger uh, cooperative of agencies, what else could we provide that would help support that? Well, we're going to get to that. Go ahead, Sean. Go right ahead. It's Sean. So uh, if I, one of the things I really like about this group is that we talk about learning and understanding about what's really going on there for some people who don't necessarily do understand it. And the benefit that we have, at least the, the Chiefs and I and Brian, about being in law enforcement is that we have an insider's kind of look from our perspective. So uh, just building upon a couple of things that I've heard, uh, first and foremost, in regards to uh, Chief Hughes' comment about chasing the tail and even Tori talking about that too. And that's true even the larger agencies, right? So we are always, no matter what the size of the agency, you also have the demands that are placed on the agency and the jurisdiction that's put on the agency. So whether it be a, a department of one or two or five or 10, 20 or, or 800, we're still dealing with issues on staffing that's always plaguing all of us. And so no matter what it is, the demands of the agency and the size of the agencies place that on there. So even though we have 800 troopers or 723, 720 fluctuating too all the time, uh, especially in recent times where we're losing a lot of officers nationally. I mean, look at New York City, look at our big cities, look at LA, not just from uh, issues that are affecting them, but just uh, in terms of on the national front, but also just because of the age of the current workforce that's out there. So we look at demographics, we look at you know, what is the age of the current workforce? What are retirement ages? That certainly plays a huge factor. But I just want you to think that just because uh, the larger agencies uh, maybe have more people, they also have a lot more responsibilities in terms of what they're responding to, those calls for service, those specialized units, and also the specialties that we, for example, provide to um, the other agencies that don't necessarily have those resources, uh, even in the medical vets. So think about the helicopters. You know, we primarily use the helicopters for medevacs. So into those other public services, so just something to think about in that regard. Uh, and, and us too, right? We're always looking, it's a constant struggle for all agencies to fill those spots. And to both Chief's points, they're 100% they're, they're correct. Uh, it takes a lot to, to hire somebody, to go through a rigorous hiring process, the recruitment that's involved in it, to train them, spend six months in an academy and three months in a field training program, and then be on probation thereafter for the high standards that we absolutely need to have, both coming in the door and the accountability along the way. And certainly training, which is the, the, the latter part of the conversation here so far, is critical. Uh, being an educator myself and highly involved in training and the former director of our, our academy, I can tell you that you know, questions regarding the Delaware Tech program, um, we started that program. So when, when we now retired, Major Hawkins was the director of training and I worked together with then uh, Colonel Coote to start in 2012 in, our, in our, a, an agreement, which still stands, 
with Delaware Technical Community College statewide, all three campuses that partner up uh, Council on Police Training Instructors to teach the classes as part of the curriculum with Delaware Tech. So it's an accredited program. What, how does that benefit? Most of the agencies that send well, people there, the people that enter those departments, those, they're in a criminal justice or they have an interest in criminal justice. Some have an interest in just knowing more about it. They may not necessarily be when they enter a program, but then say, you know what, this isn't for me or I can help support in some other way. Basically what that does is they go to class like they normally did. They're taught by those instructors. It breaks down the barriers of having somebody as a us versus them mentality. They get to see police officers as human beings instructing topical areas, but also in the academic setting. They have the opportunity to ask the questions. They're exposed to an academy environment by providing a non-COVID environment, be able to go, up, go over to the academy and spend tours over there, bring their families over there, see a canine training, much like we do in our police academies um, for non-police officers, for the community to come involved and see what those are. So we've been doing that program since 2012. Uh, and before that, uh, they can also come into that program and uh, get credit. So because they're being trained by council and police training certified instructors, the courses that they get at Delaware Tech in that law enforcement option or LEO program are exactly referable over to the Delaware State Police Academy's curriculum. So in other words, here's the benefit. If I take that course over at Delaware Tech, I don't necessarily have to take that if I'm selected in terms of the police academy, no matter what academy is in the state of Delaware, not just DSPs. Second of all, if I do repeat that class, well, that's even greater knowledge because I'm learning what I learned at Delaware Tech in the LEO program. And now I'm getting that course taught again, maybe by the same instructor, maybe a different instructor. And now I'm doing that rote knowledge is getting really internalized to those individuals by going over that material better. Again, circling back to how important training is. So, and to furthermore on that, in the Delaware Tech, we have a reverse articulation agreement with them as well, which means that if you didn't have a degree and you came into the, the academy, you completed the academy, the credits you get from completing the academy will then circulate back to Delaware Tech to help you finish your degree and get that. So to me, it's a win-win in so many different areas with that. Now, beyond Delaware Tech, we also have an articulation agreement we've had since 2006 with Wilmington University. So with Wilmington University, even going farther back there, uh, I'm very proud, uh, I'm very biased when I say this, we have a, a very comprehensive leadership development program that's uh, very intense. Uh, it's a three-week program and that uh, Colonel Zebley and I facilitate and have been since 2006. And we offer that up to our officers from the region, throughout the region, the mid-Atlantic region. So we've had people as far as way of Vermont, Maryland, uh, you know, all around Pennsylvania, New Jersey, routinely that are come into our program Three weeks, Wilmington University gives credit for that program. We actually have the course at uh, have the course rather at Wilmington University, and for successfully completing that, it, I mean it's 31 lessons. It's very arduous, huge, huge textbooks. But for completing that, they're entitled to nine undergraduate credits or three courses towards a bachelor's degree or one master's class, uh, three three credits on a graduate level course. So now there's, there's obviously a great deal of homework, there's checks and balances, there's, there's a lot of work, I mean, the Chief Hughes knows it very well. But again, that's a partnership with our universities and the university then also giving credit for not only completing, they have a reverse articulation agreement. So they're giving credit for our program, but they're also giving credit for completing a, a accredited police academy. So there is great involvement in our state with uh, other institutes of, of education and above and beyond that, too, we look at some larger groups, FBI National Academy, right? So we, we partner certainly with them, IACP. So we go up well and beyond to be able to provide a, the best education that we can. And does that mean that it's perfect? Of course not. There's a lot of room to grow. But I think for the purpose of this discussion, it's important to kind of know and, and take all that into consideration. So hopefully I wasn't too verbose. No, we've got it recorded there, Sean, so it's all good. <laughs> we, we've got the information. So, so I have a question before we move on to police incidents of, you know, physical engagement and, and, and violence and, and who was on, on that particular issue. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the demographics of what you saw, um, Brian and, and Paige and, um, and, 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 and James and Tori, can you, can you, can you talk about that a little bit? You know, who, who, what is the law enforcement personnel looking like across the state? Demographically, male, female, 
um, you know, race, gender, age? What did you see? Um, I saw majority white male. Um, I think more so in the southern two counties. Um, I know departments have talked about, um, like DENREC is very active in trying to go to minority campuses, minority job fairs to recruit. Um, I know Georgetown does a lot um, with their Latin American communities um, in trying to recruit and with community policing. Um, but I mean, it's majority white male from what I saw. Anybody else? Uh, hello. Yep. Can you hear me? Hi, who's that? Yes, this I can. Mr. Mah- this is Mr. Muhammad Bay. Uh, just briefly, I heard Very you good. talking about the, the uh, training. Um, uh, I hear by Dell Tech, uh, Wilmington College, Delaware State. Uh, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from San Vicente State University in Huntsville, Texas. They got a police academy there. I just want to throw that out there. That's a good resource. I'm just getting off work at the Howard Young uh, Correctional Facility. I'm doing a lot of medical work as opposed to counseling, so I'm uh, miscombobulated right now. In fact, I'm on my way to a funeral service, you know. And uh, so I'm sorry to hear that. So you just, that's fine. Thank you for joining us. Just put us on mute, and if you can listen in, as long as you can listen in, we'd appreciate it. All right, no problem. Appreciate it. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. So, so did anybody else see anything else in terms of the demographic? How old is the average law enforcement officer in the state of Delaware. What, were you able to see that? Anybody? Maybe that's something, you know, these are things, you know, just want to think about um, that we could, you know, look at later. But did you happen to see any of that in terms of the content? Do we know what that is? Because I heard a couple of you talk about attrition, retirement, things of those nature and what have you that, you know, is, is a real issue as it relates to recruitment and et cetera as well. So did you get any gauge of, of what kind of situation we're in in law enforcement snapshot or just based on the data that you had? What about you, Tori? Um, and, you know, we're hearing from our, 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 our chiefs here and what have you, but what did the data tell you? What do you, what do you have going on in Smyrna by, by, as an example? Yeah, so I can tell you, um, we're in a we're in a definite, uh, a very young police department right now, and you know my staff and I talk about it weekly um, with just our concerns with, you know, the age of everybody because we have had such we do not have a problem with people staying. Um, we are actually starting to have people that are retiring, which is a good thing, which means that they are staying. But the problem is, is they've all started retiring now, so. I want to say the average age of my department is probably 23 or 24. Um, I, I am hiring a group of kids, as I call them right now, and they're all anywhere between 21 and 22 years old. Um, mm-hmm. So, and that's that's the last five to six officers that I've just hired. So you think about, I've hired five to six officers, I'm getting ready to hire five more. I'm a 29 officer police department, and over 10 of them are less than 23 years old. Okay. Okay. So they, they've got a, you know, you've got, you've got hope for the future there if they decide to stay with you for a while. We do. Okay. What about anybody else? Sean, you, RL, anyone else, you know, in terms of, and Paige, what did you I, say? I was going to add you, that. One of the, go ahead. Uh, one of the challenges or one of the things I think, and in, in having had to staff 24 seven facilities is that particularly when you get some of the younger set and then as they, might engage and have a family or whatever is that while you might not be able to adjust compensation what they're looking for is something to alleviate some of the shift work the the you know and nobody at that unless you've ever had to work shift work and you know when you've had two or three shifts in one week or you know look at how you're staffing but look at the hours required for the work um longer days shorter weeks versus whatever um i've always found that if you have the flexibility to do that and to really even sometimes do that survey of your of your folks about what they would prefer it it can be um eye-opening to see that you have people that actually prefer a night shift because of daycare reasons or this that or the other so while we may not be able to adjust compensation are there other things that that the departments might be able to approach you know to look at or maybe in the line of police work it would be to get additional education and specialize in a certain area where it might be investigations or it might be different things. But um, I also think that when you come back and you 
and we're talking about the programs that are out there. I think we need a really change in some of the focus of some of the criminal justice programs so that we're being more inclusive of behavioral sciences and, um, and some other things than, than the criminal, some of the other stuff that we've always been focused on um, looking at the changes because uh, some curriculums are changing, but just not, just not quickly enough. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that might be a, a thing to look at as well. And we all have to keep in mind that RL, you mentioned that, that 18 to 21, because you can't hire them until they're 21. Seeds, inspire, we can put them in college in a program that's gonna be low to no cost for them. We have to capture that interest and help them early on to learn about community engagement so they don't make bad decisions as a youth that will prohibit them from contributing to a community that they want to when they're an adult. Um, we made some legal changes years ago so that you know if a minor was drinking that he was never gonna or she ever to be a law enforcement officer in Delaware. So are there other things that we set up at, that create a barrier to overcoming some bad decisions as a youth. I think we need to look at those too, because you know, there's nothing like an example, a excellent counselor is perhaps one that has had some um, things that they've overcome in their past. And so maybe when we're looking at some um, law enforcement officers, we might need to change our focus a little bit um, because making one mistake as a youth doesn't mean that you can never overcome it. So just, just a comment there mm -hmm. on yeah, thank you for that, Ruth. Thank you, that good insight. So so I had a question. Someone had, we sent the collective bargaining unit agreement out and we were talking about, Ruth was talking about the, um, you know, shift differentials and things and, and the impact and how hard that is on families and different things like that and what have you and considerations for either staying in the job, changing the job, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, are the bargaining units, um, dictating to some degree or uh, have a proviso as to who gets what shift by seniority, things of that nature and what have you. Who had that content or who can speak to that? If it's a question that we need to, you know, come back to that we can, that we need to look at, that's one of the things, just really looking at our collective bargaining agreements and as we're entering in those kinds of things or having those conversations, the impact that it has long term not just you know for for the immediate issue as we're negotiating those those may some be some issues that come up as well is there anything else that we and again this is our first look so this is the first fresh i'm sure we'll you know we've kind of um talked about a number of things and we want to probably continue to talk about a lot more as it relates to that because did someone did someone have something Teresa, uh, this is keith if i may yes go ahead keith go right uh, ahead. very quickly uh i don't know if this come up or not yet but the question I have is to the chiefs and uh, representative of law enforcement officers, do you have or have you done satisfaction surveys? Uh, mm. What is it, do you have any under your belt already or in your, in your file drawer around satisfaction surveys? What are the things that, uh, the question then becomes, what are the things that would uh, officers look that would satisfy them to stay in law enforcement? In, in my experience with recruitment and retention, uh, the, the axiom is, is uh, people don't leave jobs, they leave managers. I mean, so you can throw that blanket across a lot of companies and organizations and say there's a truism there, right? Law enforcement may be slightly different in that they may not leave managers per se, but it could be part of it, but they may leave uh, conditions. Uh, the public is hard on us. Uh, the job is becoming dissatisfying because of that pressure. I, I'm just curious as to do we have satisfaction surveys that, that we've done and or, or should maybe do? Uh, and, and, I, I get, and, and if we do have satisfaction surveys, can we take a look at them as a committee to better understand uh, where the officers are coming from in terms of what they're looking for in terms of retention? Because therein may be some ideas around uh, problem and root cause analysis as well as solutions as well. So I, I open that question up. Do we have satisfaction surveys? So, so no, I do not have the satisfaction surveys, but um, we're a small agency. My office is right here uh, and we have constant contact. So no, I don't have that. To answer the question as to where the frustrations are, well, but before I do that, I just wanted to go back and address one thing on the collective bargaining piece. 
some of the things yes. you described in there, ma'am, where they, they were under – and the one that I have here under management um, rights as far as our staffing okay. and those kind of so, – so that may be – each individual collective bargaining agreement you may have to review. That's unfortunate to have to do that, but mm -hmm. but there mm -hmm. should be some boilerplate information there. Uh, but back to this, mm -hmm. you know, where the where the rub is. The rub is around. It is around pay, um, and it sounds shallow when I say that. And I don't mean to say that. But when I have an officer that um, one of my officers is is applying to another large agency in the state of Delaware, and if they go there. They will make a twelve thousand dollars more the very next day. Well, not the next day, but the, over the, a year more. That's a significant amount. Even though that officer enjoys the community aspect of what we're doing here at Georgetown or in this smaller community, that's a significant amount. Um, uh, primary breadwinner for that family, and so that's significant. That that is a driver. I can't compete. Georgetown can't. We can't compete. Uh, uh, under the current status of where we are. So then to uh, Ruth's point about the ability to go – my career on the state police, I had a wonderful career. I got to do about every three years, three and a half years, I did something different. That's not an opportunity here for our officers at Georgetown. I have four detectives. That's it. And so the folks go in there, and it may be two, three, four years before someone rotates back around, and if you've been working – on patrol and you're working 12-hour shifts and you've been doing that for 12, 13, 14 years, that you could tend to be dissatisfied. So having that ability to move folks around, you know, so that I don't know if Tori sees some of that too with his his agency, but so no to satisfaction surveys, yes to having a, a decent idea of what of what's going on um, and some of the reasons why some folks are dissatisfied. So, so let me. Can I? Can I just um, ask this? Interject here, and Keith, if if you, you know, we, we, if you could help us with this, would, this would be really good. Um, that's one of the things that we had, like in the kind of like uh, code of conduct in that area, and what have you, looking at if there were um, satisfaction surveys specifically. Just what you said. We said, look at that. We haven't gotten anything yet necessarily, unless we continue to dive through the data. But one of the thoughts I had was, and I, I asked the committee as well, is that we need to really, at this point, it's great for us to look at the data and have the conversation amongst ourselves and what have you, but it would be really good to have a, a round robin with uh, some officers and some persons from across the state. If we could figure out a way to do that, um, and would you be willing to help us in that, in that regard with, with facilitating that? Yeah, so um, I, I think in response to that uh, would be somewhat of a, a focus group, if you will. Yes. Um, and uh, we may be able to configure a, uh, a virtual focus group if we mm -hmm. uh, develop a uh, set of questions, <coughs> excuse me, that's vetted by the subcommittee and then mm -hmm. uh, configure a, a virtual sub focus group with a cross section of officers from different varying departments that would, you know, volunteer time and energy to participate mm -hmm. on it for the good of the cause. So we, we could we could work on that. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Is that something, committee? You all think that would be beneficial as well? I, I just think that we cannot, um, you know, from a perspective, it's good to look at the content, but do you not think we need to talk to these important stakeholders about, you know, what's happening with them and you know, try to come up with a design that um, they can weigh in? Well, well, let me just additionally say, though, that, uh, I, I, again, I, I think that's a good direction, but I, I, I think we want to be very conscientious about uh, what, our, what our angle of approach is. And we may have mm -hmm. to learn a little bit more about the subject amongst us all uh, mm -hmm. so that we can configure questions that uh, really are relevant to, 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 the, to the police officers. Um, and, and, and I just say that as a caution. So uh, while I agree that that's an approach, I want to make sure we're more learned about the subject before we start asking questions of other people, because mm -hmm. in, in, in most cases, we want to uh, 
really be able to know what information we're getting and, and why we're asking it. And so that we're, we're real clear about it. That's that's my only caution. Like we want to be careful when we do that. I agree. We, we're we're not ready yet. We're still we're just scratching yeah. the surface here. So when we get to that point, that'll be really good. Well, folks, let's move on to uh, to the next subject. We've got two others here. What have you? If we get through all four, then great. I doubt it. If we get through two, then we've got work to do when we come back in January um, to do some more reading and finding out some more information. This conversation has been rich. I think it's really, really good to get a sense of what you're looking at and then talk about it and digest it, and then we'll look at it again. Uh, Because from some of the dialogue and feedback from members of you on the committee, I think we've got some other things that we want to go back and think about. So in terms of who, who was it that had police incidents or at least uh, indicated they had interest in that and did some uh, review as it relates to incidents of physical engagement and violence. And again, this is along the line and appropriate for our committee as it relates to workforce uh, development and issues related to that. All we're looking at this particular time are statistics um, as it relates to this. And we may even have this somewhere else that we can bring into the committee, but um, did we have persons that, that looked at that specifically that are on the call today? Maybe not. Maybe this is something we've got to come back to. Looks like it. Looks like it so far. So that's that's fine. Um, I think another one of the outliers that we have here is funding and capacity policies and procedures. So we know that we don't have. I, I, I can tell you some some work that I've done as it relates to this in terms of finding content is the collection of all of the, the budgets to the extent that we possibly can, can do that, as well as looking at all of the federal resources through the Criminal Justice Council that come into the state, including uh, our most recent even enacted resources that we voted on uh, as, as a member just uh, Monday, and, uh, and other resources that are coming into the state as well. Will we capture everything? Probably not, but we're gonna be looking at that so that we can bring that detail back. I think from this conversation today, it was very clear that we need to also know some things about expenditures as it relates internally to overtime. Um, knowing about those kinds of things around overtime uh, would be very, very good to, to find out. Are there any other areas as it relates to finance that um, you all would like to know about? I'm interested in, uh, as I think about it too, as Sean was talking about the educational part, like what does a what does a gold standard training program look like? What does training look like in uh, in in police uh, forces? And and what you described in and of itself, what how much does that cost? And are you funded appropriately to to be able to do that if you had your wish list? Sean, I'm going to ask you if you can you talk a little bit about what it, what the coursework is like that program that you described. How much does that cost? So in terms of, well, we talked about a lot of programs, right? So and yeah, but the ones you were talking about, yeah. Well, just just pick one and just talk to us. A, a, you know, I'm just thinking along the lines if we were at a point to make recommendations or what have you, and looking at those kinds of things. What does that What does that look like? What does that cost in Delaware today? So. Everything costs something to some degree, right? But there, in mm -hmm. terms of in terms of a fee, you know, for example, our partnerships with with both of those higher academic institutions is it's, it's free, right? There's there's no fee per se. The both Delaware Tech uh, and Lincoln University, uh, you know, that's a, it's a it's a it's a partnership. So, but in terms of, of actually, you know, students coming in, well. Again, there's a salary. So when the chief sent an officer to an academy, we're, we're putting a trooper in, there's an expense to that, right? The, you're paying that person's mm -hmm. salary, you're paying the instructor's salary. The facilities, uh, certainly uh, they can uh, you know, look to be improved too. Um, you know, the quality instructors can certainly always be something that we're looking at. So, and that all takes time, right? So time to, to build the instructional cadre, time to develop the curricula, time to bring in, right? And here's something too, we're our greatest source of funding exported is coming from is bringing in experts from outside to come in and talk about different themes, right? So, you know, for example, uh, you know, I'm looking at, uh, you know, a national expert on implicit bias to come in and, and talk. Not that we haven't had it, we have had that, but it, it's a continued discussion that's very important that, that we engage upon as part of the you know, president's uh, 21st century task force recommendations. So we look at those things, 
we need to always be cognizant of that. And those are expensive. Outside resources are very expensive. Venues, instructor stipends, handout materials, even if it's virtual, there's gonna be something like that. So that's where the money really comes into, but we try to reduce the cost the best that we can. So for all the elective courses, for example, that are at the, I'll speak for the DSP Academy, but I know that they are more counterparts. And the other academies, you know, we're not charging uh, officers to come in for, for elective courses. In other words, there might be a, a different course on criminal investigations, maybe a, a, a course that's coming in to, to look at mental health awareness and how, and how we can better work with behavioral health issues. And we're bringing people from the community that come in and gratis to be able, just like this committee is, to try to work to improve the relationships and develop the police officers. So there's no fee for that that the agency is charging, but you have an inherent fee of paying a salary, paying electric, you know, those basic fundamentals that are there. The greatest uh, for, again, funding outsources is bringing in outside experts, especially content experts that are coming in. That's where the expense is coming quite a bit. Okay. Anybody else? You know, Tori, you and I was going to say uh, that I, I think ahead, also Keith. Deshaun's uh, point about fees, you, you mm -hmm. back to the smaller uh, courses, uh, Chief Hughes, you got overtime. You, if you got a person in a the course, then you got overtime or backfilling that person for their shift to consider for the smaller agencies. So there is a there is a cost associated, even though the coursework is free. Administratively, as you were saying, Sean, there is a cost associated with the opportunity cost. You're 100 mm -hmm. percent correct. Yeah, you know, it just made me think about it. You know, even if it's in kind, there's some cost somewhere um, as it relates to 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 that. What about you, Tori, and um, and you, RL, in in terms of you know potential costs, and then we're going to move on to general policies and procedures and code of conduct guidelines. Tori, what do you think? So, you know, again, just like Sean said, you know, we are fortunate enough that we can utilize the Delaware State Police Academy and, and it is free for us to, to get some of the courses that we, we need to get. Um, but just like everybody else said, there is the cost of overtime. You know, uh, it, no matter what, whether or not I'm paying somebody to go during their shift or I'm paying somebody to go during their time off, um, then you get back to, you know, people getting frustrated because they want their time off. And, you know, now you've got to send them to training. COVID has kind of helped. We've been utilizing a, a program called Police One, and it's allowed us to, to do a lot of training um, and give our officers that piece that they can actually do it while they're on their shift during some of the downtime to help get those hours that they need to get. Um, and we encourage them to utilize it for even more than what we require for them. And what we do is we kind of do a, a monthly theme and uh, tell them, hey, this month, the, you know, your, your theme is going to be, you know, um, officer safety, and we'll give them four or five videos that we want them to watch. Some of them go from a half an hour to an hour. Um, so we've been able to, to utilize that platform a little bit to kind of help. It's, it's one cost across the board um, for them. So it works for us. Okay. Okay. What about you, Ariel? Yeah, I, I have... Um nothing else added that, that they've covered it well okay okay great okay good okay good so so we know that there's some issues in terms of funding and capacity we've got to get to so now let's move to our general operating policies and procedures and have a conversation a bit about that which means that we're, we're going to start it and I'm sure we're going to need to come back to it because we're at 525 now and about a quarter of or so we want to uh, get to uh, ask if there's any persons for public comment or close to that so Ruth, we had you, Kaylin, and um, and I think do we have you, Ariel, also on there, Ann Farley and Sandra Smithers. So um, the content that you had and read, what are your thoughts about what you're seeing out there, uh, Ruth? Well, my one basic comment would be that you can readily tell the department that has more funding than ever because there's a couple of programs out there, and depending on the the funding, um, you know the their guidelines were um, using some national standards that I think were a little bit higher than others. And so once again, I saw that a little bit of inequity between the departments that have more money to work with and those that don't. And, you know, coming right off the top of my mind, and I think I reached out to them, to Brian, the chief of Millsboro, because I could look at Millsboro Police Department, a couple of others, and tell where um, some of their policies and procedures, the code of conduct was particularly good for a couple of those. But once again, I think it depends on which guidelines, and I understand some of those are more expensive for departments to, to go into. But generally, 
it was very hard to, I mean, all of the, all of them guidelines were fairly consistent. The real issue comes in with what are they actually doing? And, and that's where we're missing because nobody's really, they're talking, this is what their policies and procedures are. But when you come back to that second thing that was on our agenda today, that's where, that's where the gap is. That's where you don't see. So I can't say if they're really doing what they say they're doing, but the code of conduct look like they're all pretty good. Okay. Okay. What about you, Kaylin? Are you still on with us? Yes, I'm here. Um, I took my video off because okay. I was having um, issues hearing everyone. Um, so I wanted to make sure my audio was consistent. Um, but no problem. Um, uh, my first thought um, was uh, that we don't have access to personnel complaints. Um, that was something that um, was on the list of for this work group to look at. And it's because of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights um, that, you know, we don't have access to that to that information. And I'm not asking for, you know, identifying information um, of officers, but just more so um, an overview, a general overview of the types of complaints um, that is coming from the community, because that's part of the reason why we're here, right, is because the community mm -hmm. called for reform. We, we, we marched, you know, in the streets by, by, by the hundreds in June. And, you know, we can't see this information that, you know, you're asking us to um, evaluate. So that's, that's one gap um, that, that I think uh, really, really uh, hurts, um, you know, my ability to like fully uh, look at, you know, this, the things that we're asked to look at. But I would recommend um, that we repeal the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights um, and replace it. Uh, with um, a code that is aligned with all the recommendations that come out of this committee. And that's things like, you know, more transparency, more accountability. And I think it will improve um, police culture overall. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so here's the thing. I, I want to think, I mean, you you, you made a couple of points there. I want to clarify a little bit or just get a general sense. Um, overall, you're right. There is a, national call, national interest as it relates to law enforcement accountability and and, and what is what's happening in general. Um, I, I think our our objective is to to look specifically at what the Delaware story is um, mm -hmm. in and of itself. So that's what we're doing in terms of trying to find this content. If I hear you correctly, you're saying that you don't have information about those pieces as it relates to whether it's code of conduct, reportable code of conduct, I, I was looking along the lines of, and that's one of the things we want to look at when we talk about incidents, whether it's uh, physical engagement, violence, or whatever it might be, or even if it meant um, internal um, um, complaints against each other or the agency or any of those aspects of it, um, and then looking along the lines of expectations as it relates to what the code of conduct guidelines are. Are there code of conduct guidelines for every officer in the state of Delaware, per se, or in these police entities, per se? And then there afterwards, you know, yes, to your point, Caitlin, talking about, you know, accountability and what that ultimately looks like. I just want to make sure that we can, can, can at least um, go down that road in terms of looking for what that might ultimately be and then making sure we're clear about what it is versus assuming what it is. We don't know, I think, at this point, and we've said this before, we don't know what we don't know at this point. But if I hear you correctly, you're saying that um, it's, it's, it's absent. You can't find information about that. But were you able to find information, and it, it's, it's but and and, so I still say that's an outlier, but was there information as it relates to what the code of conduct should be in terms of guidelines? procedures and general operating procedures, did you, policies, did you see those pieces? Um, are you referring to uh, in the, the survey or the, the data that we received? Yes, the data that you received, because it was that the piece, of, the piece that I thought you guys signed on for is general operating policies, procedures, code mm -hmm. of conduct guidance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so um, I also looked at the laws authorizing the police entity structure and authority. Um, and so Leah mm -hmm. Bohr falls under that piece. Um, but um, as far as, you know, and I was also looking at the personnel complaints, the types and dispositions, um, that's also underneath uh, the our, our work group um, explanation. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Um, one thing that also stood out to me um, that I must uh, mention is um, the lack of diversity um, in some of mm-hmm. these agencies. Um, most of it, especially the Delaware State Police, um, you know, has a large percentage of white males, um, and it's really not reflective of, um, you know, the the demographics throughout the state. Um, so I mm-hmm. think, you know, again, um, improving uh, workplace culture, um, improving the laws that authorize the police entity and structure and authority, um, and making it, you know, uh, I think, you know, I think it'll help attract um, people from uh, these marginalized groups that have been negatively impacted by policing. Um, so I, I definitely think uh, that's a solution to our diversity problem. But mm-hmm. I was not able to see, I didn't get a code of conduct. Um, did If other people received that, I did not. Okay, the code of oh. conduct guidelines, you may not go right ahead, Keith. I was going to say that, uh, I, you know, I, you, you made a good statement there in terms of uh, the diversity, but the the whole notion of operating policies, procedures, code of conduct are really uh, uh, system issues, operating system issues. And mm-hmm. um, so in a lot of ways, as we take a look at and examine those, to me, it, it almost uh, can strip away who's in the job regarding diversity, et cetera, because the, 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 those statements, policies, procedures, code of conduct gets at what's inherent within the job, work and job structure. So mm-hmm. um, I, I, I think that uh, we, the, the, I remember in our initial meeting um, as we were kind of kicking the tires on the whole subject and, and kind of you know, searching our way, this conversation came up as something we needed to take a look at. And one of the mm-hmm. notions that was brought up at that time, I don't know, remember by whom, was that uh, how different is uh, policing uh, county to county or, or, or city to city? Yeah. Uh, to me, mm-hmm. I, I, and I'm just kind of overstating it, I know, but if, if I'm fighting a fire, there's techniques to fighting a fire that Firefighters everywhere know the techniques to fight a fire. You, know, you don't fight fires differently in uh, Philly than you do in Wilmington. Uh, That's you know, what maybe you do, because I'm not a firefighter, so please forgive me. But the same, mm-hmm. I would think, would uh, associate itself with policing. So how different can or should policies, procedures, codes of conduct be? Um, and can we then, therefore, look at uniformity around those Whereas those uh, those uh, policies procedures don't set a standard of engagement that has a cost associated with it with it in terms of equipment and 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 and, and those kind of things. So I think the comment that was made earlier, and I'm going to close with this, was that should there should there be an examination of these things to the degree that we can evaluate the similarities and differences and whether or not there's an opportunity for us to have a blanket set uh, as, as kind of an out-of-the-box approach to this uh, across the state. Um, and, I, and I have to look to the professionals to address this because it, 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 it begs that each uh, city, municipality, uh, entity kind of looks at itself with its own identity and therefore we got to have our own thing and we have our own little twist on it. And I would dare say this applies to even within the executive branch of state government, whereas now HR is a centralized function. Prior to centralization, a lot of the agencies kind of came up with their own homegrown policies and procedures, and therefore created an atmosphere of inconsistencies in the application of fairness and equity to all employees. Uh, so now we come together and we say, let's have a consistent set of policies and procedures that blanket the executive branch. Why not the same thought process around policing? But we have to examine what those are. And, and I think these are even aside from the uh, police bill of rights. A bill of rights certainly is a, a blanket over uh, and underlying everything, I, I would agree. But uh, th- there's a layer in here around municipalities their policies, procedures, codes of conduct, similarly or different than others. 
and, and and that should not be that hard for us to get our hands on, uh, mm -hmm. just from the standpoint, regardless of the Bill of Rights, regardless of diversity, what's the systemic view and snapshot, and what does that tell us around us as police being taken advantage of our scale and trying to um, eliminate a variable that uh, that we can that 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 we can all have some consistency around and some uniformity around, and be a little bit more out of the box around. And I'll I'll just stop. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. You make a very good point because I I was thinking along the same line. This is just my feedback, and and it'd be interesting to hear what you all say. In my mind, if there is a gold standard um, protocol, policy, guideline for officers to follow to do X, whatever that ultimately may be in terms of the variations of things. Um, there may be some aspects of it to take into consideration around um, awareness, cultural competency, and what have you, but if the gold standard is X, most of, and I've, I've written lots of policy, and that's just me, but in general, I don't write policy for one group to do this and one group to do that and the other based on how they show up in the world, so to speak, or the demographics of it. Those things are kind of taken into consideration, but the policy is what the policy is, per se, and then it becomes the issue of accountability. To, to since it's to Kalen's feedback about it's important as you're crafting uh, policy and those kinds of things that the, the writing team um, protocols and what have you, considering that, is inclusive of perhaps maybe, you know, what the world looks like, so to speak. You have to do that in order to have a diversity of thought um, and, and et cetera. So I can live within the, the scope of that, but, you know, and I can live within the scope of that, just me personally and professionally, knowing that that to me is the thing that, uh, and I don't know if we have any lawyers on, on, on here, but that to me is the thing that keeps you out of court. <laughs> and it's, it's defendable is fair and consistent and et cetera. So just some thoughts and, and, and thank you, Keith, for your feedback. Ruth, did you have a thought? I, I did. I and what I wanted to say when we first got our packets and there were volumes and volumes of information. And when I reviewed those for the operating policies and procedures, it was very easy for me to see that most of the law enforcement agencies in Delaware were subscribing to one or two schoolings and I, I can't remind, know the chiefs can probably help me remember. For some reason, I'm thinking COPT, but there were two different groups. I don't have the files in front of me that were primarily were the guidelines, the protocol. So they had that consistency and that national standard that were out there that they were held to. And so mm -hmm. I noticed that over and over again because the language was the same. The procedures and the policies were very much mirror images of one another. So I think they were using some type of national guidelines, either one level or another level that they were using from all still fairly consistent with each other on that. And then Keith, to your point, I was one of the proponents and heavy advocates that lobbied um, Governor Carney when he first come in to create a human resource office because I saw the different things that were going on in state agencies. So, and, and that was the reason for that. Um, but I did, I did note, you know, and reviewing again that most of the departments have consistent policies. I think what we were lacking is to see, um, are they firm, fair, and consistent in the manner in which they address potential problems? And that's what's not obvious or transparent. And being, an, you know, I can understand that they don't want to release specific information on individuals, but it would really help me to see the kind of complaints. And I think that was a question I had. What are the main types of complaints that you receive and how are those addressed so that it looks like that we're just not saying, um, because I've had constituent concerns and when I raise them, you know, a local level, here's this concern I had and they're like, well, you know, an officer is allowed to have a bad day. And I'm like, well, yes, but the public may not agree with that. Bad day. So exactly. I'm trying to keep that balance. That's that's important. That's very important. And you know, to your to your to your point, you know, are we able to follow that and what have you in terms of making sure um, that those exist um, from entity to entity? I think will will help us along the lines of 
making sure that um, there's some consistency, um, whether that's the, the, uh, the, the police chief's counsel, certification processes, those kinds of things, you know, ultimately when we get to that point of recommending and also making sure that there's considerations about who's pulling those pieces together, who's contributing to those things and what have you. So is there along with that, you? I don't know. Well, Maybe there is peer review. Maybe when something comes up, and, and that's just something I don't know because you don't know what you don't know. But but maybe Chief James, maybe you review something from RLs and say, you know, was this was this pre you know that kind of peer review that you can do, or what kind of system that you might have developed, um, you know, to to talk about and and having you know been in senior level HR and you know you have that that other colleague that you can talk to discreetly, not naming names, but here's the situation and you review this for me and what are your thoughts? I mean, I don't know if that goes on to some degree or not. And, and is that for something potential that we wanna talk about a, a peer review of situations, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Kaylin, were you, were you, had you completed, go ahead, I'm sorry, who was that? This is RL. I'm on. I'm on this. Uh, on this group. I'm on this subgroup of okay, this. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Go right ahead. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I just want to point out a couple of things. Mr. Hunt is spot on when he talks about standardization, and that's why we have in Delaware we have what's called DPAC, Delaware Police Accreditation Council. And so, as we move now, I will tell you that it was established several years ago, and it went dormant. It went dormant for several years, and now. In the last couple of years, it's really come back around, and we are trying to get all of our Delaware agencies uh, accredited through the Delaware um, accreditation process. And then to Ruth's point, she talked about the national standard, which is CALEA, and there are several agencies in Delaware, the larger agencies for the most part, and then there's Millsboro, Middletown, um, Dover, Newcastle County, State Police, Wilmington, and I'm sure I'm forgetting one or two other that are CALEA. And that is a national thing. Then there is an expense involved there. And those agencies, and depending on their side, oh, and the University of Delaware is uh, also CLIA accredited through the, the academic side. There are a number, and those things, and those, there are over 400 standards that those agencies must mm -hmm. meet in order to become mm -hmm. In Delaware, uh, and in Delaware DPAC, we have 112 standards, but in those standards, we count them a little bit differently than CLIA. There are a number of, um, like it might be standard 1.2.3, A, B, C, D, E, you know, a number of things in there. So there are a number of standards. So we are working through that to the standardization point. Also on that one, and you talked about the fair, firm, fair, and consistent. I always refer, I refer that to kind of policy, procedure, and practices. Do you have a good policy? Is it, are there good procedures that go along with that policy? And are you doing it? Is it a practice? And if that's mm -hmm. in a nice straight line, then you're normally operating in with consistent fairness, right? And so the thing mm -hmm. about accreditation, what it does is it does require the agency to have the policy. It requires the agency to have the procedure, and you must show the practice. You must show the proof that you are doing that. And so um, mm -hmm. that that is a very good thing around the general operating policy. But to be clear, and as I sit and listen tonight, we need to probably take a look at, and, and the chief's counsel, before I get there, the chief's council has 11 or 12 or possibly more model policies that the council rolls out with legal um, folks taking a look at those policies. I think there's some cooperation a lot of times with the attorney general's office and Chief Ogden could speak to that, I'm sure, about those model policies and they go out and are suggested to our agencies to pick those up. Um, but uh, to look at our policies again, one of the things that we probably need to do is to dive into hard into our policies to ensure that they're not biased in any way, to make sure that we're not doing yeah. something inadvertently. And so that is that's a good thing. I, I think I just picked that up tonight listening that that I need to do and, and to probably ask for some help to do that. Yeah, there's always, you know, thank you for sharing that. There's always room now. So it's clear to me that what needs to happen going forward is that. This is our first look in December. This has been a robust conversation. We're going to be doing some more homework and then come back in January because, and I want to start right where we've left off here with the general operating policies, procedures, code of conduct guidelines. We're going to dig that some more. And then also at the same time, look at some of these um, standardization programs that we talked about, whether it's Khalil or, you know, Chief Counsel and the, uh, the other entities and what have you too, so that we're, we're able to kind of have that dialogue or share that dialogue. So um, we'll be looking for content 
on those as well. I think when we come back, we know we have to do more work as it relates around police incidents of physical engagement and go back and look at who we had there in that place. And then um, also make sure that um, we probably need to talk some more about the development issue, recruitment and what have you. And then at the same time, make sure that uh, we talk about funding. We'll get to funding. That's, that's, that's the, the outlier for us clearly um, as well. So we also now want to move really quickly because we want to get to our public uh, comment is, is that um, we, we have not had, we, we, we did have, and I think that the chairs didn't, didn't mention, we've been doing uh, talk arounds um, uh, in the community and the community policing one, we were kind of joined with that one, but we really didn't have a lot of conversation around workforce development. So Frank and I are, are working with the chairs around developing uh, a listening session that's dedicated specifically to workforce development uh, for the community and making sure that we have some expertise. We may reach out to some of you on this call to help us with that. But we were looking potentially in terms of the schedule for our next meeting, which would be January 26th, we would meet and then right afterwards have our listening session. I know that makes for a long time for some of us, but just while we already have ourselves there and try to plan that for that time and work back from it, um, if that would work okay for you all, we would like to try to get that scheduled. Is that all right with you? Everybody, let me see some thumbs. Okay, that's okay, good. All righty, and so we'll look for that for January 26th. Continue to follow up with our content here, so continue to read, ask questions, those kind of things, send notes to each other, send notes to me and Frank and et cetera. And I would want to ask if there's any um, person signed up for public comment. Do we have any persons identified for public comment? Um, we actually need to ask them to raise their hand for public comments. So if you would like to make- I'm unable to, I've, I've been having a challenge to see the raised hand. So if you can help me with that, that would yeah. be great. Yeah, if you would like to make public comment, please utilize the raise hand function. Uh, it seems that no one is raising their hand for public comment. If you would like to make public comment, please utilize the raise hand function. Or if you'd like to submit written public comment, please email your remarks to leotaskforce at delaware.gov. Uh, Alexa, I don't have a, um, a comment. Um, I have a question. Um, sure. When is the expected deadline for uh, these recommendations? Um, since you know the start of session is, is creeping up on us very quickly. And I think that should probably go to the to the chairs. I mean, we we talked about that before, but if they are are they still on? I don't. Yes. Uh, that's Frank. Frank, um, Representative Cook. What you know? Can you review again? I think we talked about you and Daryl um, before about when we wanted to have and begin to look at some a product. Well, first we want to get through to the uh, midterm and see what we have and, and and go from there, and then you know, like I I was saying earlier. Uh, we'll try to get done what we have to get done and, and going forward. And sometimes it takes a little bit more time because it's so broad and so big mm -hmm. and that it is so important to our constituents and also to the state of Delaware and to our general assembly that we make sure we cover everything. Th this is very, very big. Uh, when I look throughout the, the, the different states and, and in the nation, the, uh, it takes a while for some of this stuff to get through. And that's why we have uh, some of the um, different uh, uh, subjects that we have um, look at it through getting information and stuff through these other 48 police departments sometimes uh, or through the uh, Department of Justice or wherever we need information and, and substance. It's hard to get it and it takes a while. So really, it, you, you really can't put a, a really thumb right on it to say we got to be here then as long as we, we produce and we're moving forward. And that's what's important for the constituents and, and our police department and you all. You are the voice of the people. So I gotta make sure, you know, we cover everything. And, and it's hard to put a mm -hmm. time exactly that we can do that. And, and we're hoping we can get it done. Thank now, you. So it's not, it's, it, it, to that point, it's not due, but mm -hmm. we, we've got a little bit of time to continue to do our work. And as I see it, Kaylin, right now is that we're still kind of getting through this material and we wanna do community listening session. We want to have an opportunity potentially to look at um, the satisfaction surveys or potentially maybe doing focus groups, those kinds of things. So we've got a big work detail in front of us, but are, do you have any other thoughts? 
were you trying to say something else? Uh, no, I just, that was my only question. Okay, great. Now, I think we missed uh, Jane Hovington. Jane, did you have something to say? Yes, I did. And I didn't Go know ahead. that, you, I, I didn't know that you weren't able to see my hand raised. But, uh, no, uh, I wasn't. Go right ahead. That, mm -hmm. That's quite all right. And I have to apologize, but I had to leave my office and come home. So that's why I'm not, uh, my screen is off, but I'm, cause I'm on my phone at the moment. But in okay. the training that we're, that we have been discussing, um, I was listening intently to see if we discussed anything about diversity training. And, uh, I have to other apologize as well, because all my information, the printouts, I lost them. So I'm having to do this from memory. But the fact of the matter is the need, even if we're using a standardized uh, training, there still needs to be an in-depth diversity training to our police officers. And most of the times when you have young people coming on board, they're bringing back their society, societal attitudes. And that's where we get into so many problems. So I think it's something that we really need to look at and discuss more extensively because it's something that's creating a lot of our problems here in, um, in Delaware. And uh, I will say that uh, I, I have to always lift up uh, Chief Hughes because he has an open door policy. If we have an issue that we can go there, but we had a meeting of all uh, several of the police departments here in Sussex County. And uh, I was amazed at how many of them did not do a real diversity training within their police department. So it's something that we really need to look at. Thank you. So, so yeah, thank you, Jane, for that. So one of the things that we want to look within our materials that we've been given and provided is to determine what's actually there. Now, you've shared with us about what you know from those ones you've interacted with, but we really would like to know what that means uh, statewide. And then also, you know, before we begin to, and I, I hear what you're saying, the sensitivity around it, um, in general, in general, diversity, cultural competency, using the, you know, those terminologies, but making sure that the, that what the police agencies are doing and knowing what that is before we say, all right, they don't have it. And I know you have your experience as it relates to that. Keith, you have a thought? Yeah, I just want to comment on that. And, uh, and, and let me just say that uh, for full disclosure, I'm, I'm coming from the standpoint of the uh, diversity and inclusion officer for the state. And that is this, um, uh, diversity training or any kind of training, uh, particularly around behavior training, uh, they tended to get at the uh, mindset and even uh, emotional intelligence of an individual. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, you, you, there has been over time and space, a lot of money spent by organizations, entities or consultants to come in and do that. And then persons leave the training event or, or forum or format and go back to an environment that um, does not reinforce the training that they just received. And so there's got to be a combination of uh, the environmental element and that environmental element then always goes back to accountability. Accountability then always links back to uh, the uh, law enforcement bill of rights. And until we, uh, uh, that's the elephant in the room, uh, and until we address that uh, in terms of the, the structure and the, 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 the content of that Bill of Rights, we won't have a balance, and no one will have a balance of power uh, on the streets uh, as police are, are policing. Uh, citizens won't have a balance of power. And that's part of the problem, is that lack of balance of power. If we can create that balance of power through the accountability vis-a-vis -vis changes, repealing, however, the Bill of Rights, then you, we're in ability to, in a position to hold uh, officers accountable for behavior. And then, then the 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 individual is able to now self-manage their behavior without the, uh, the the protection of a Bill of Rights that gives them a little bit more leeway than maybe they should have or could have. Uh, as it may currently be constructed. Saying that and establishing that uh, beachhead, if you will, then you can layer in sensitivity training, uh, enlightenment training, uh, uh, perspective training, mindset training that will help facilitate that behavior. 
but until that that accountability is designed in and and or designed out as far as the bill of rights is concerned then spending money and time and energy on training is going to run into a brick wall and i don't mean that to discourage training or dismay around training but it's a dynamic of power and control and and the factor of life that uh, without that balance of power, uh, the training element w will be money lost if we don't get to the root uh, around the Bill of Rights. Okay, Keith, so then before we get right to adjournment, we're, we're buttressing right up at six o'clock. I've got a quick question for you to think about um, in, in, in considering this uh, when we come back to talk about it next meeting. So, and I agree with you completely, is that training, just for training is, is not going to benefit you said the accountability. So should there be, this is a hypothetical, should there be um, training from the, at the chief level to the front end um, and, you know, some type of requirement around accountability, those kinds of things and what have you um, that may be incorporated in the bill of rights. And I'm just throwing this out. It's not saying we do anything, but just thinking about some type of a universal way systemically to apply opportunity for training and uh, or, or requirement for training or a suggestion for training, and at the same time building in an accountability measure. So that's for uh, father for thought and for discussion next time. And uh, at this point, we're almost right at six o'clock. I'm respectful of everybody's uh, time, and would like very much uh, if you all would uh, entertain a motion for adjournment. If all minds are clear at this point. Uh, if we could do that, that would be great. So can I have a motion for adjournment? I want to say thank you to everyone. Very enlightening and uh, very important. So uh, wish everyone a happy holiday season, season safe and healthy. Thank you all very much. And I will uh, present the motion to adjourn. And I thank will you second so much, that motion. And uh, also, everyone have a great holiday season. You too. Everyone have a great holiday season. Wonderful meeting, you guys. Keep working. Thank you so much. Take care now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. You're welcome.